Commander Shepard has been recovered. The Lazarus Project will proceed as well. Welcome to the Lazarus Project Podcast, a Mass Effect podcast discussing its characters, lore, theory, and opinion. In this episode, we had a chat with Carla Elizabeth, N7 Kate, and new on the scene Paragon N7 about the indoctrination theory. This was a live episode, so you might hear some comments here and there that were in the live chat, so please don't be alarmed. Um, but more or less, it is just us chatting amongst ourselves, really. And it was such a pleasure to have the three creators chatting with myself and Tim. Please do check them out if you haven't already checked out their YouTube channels. Thank you very much. And let's jump into the episode. There we go. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the channel. So our first guest is a friend of the show, a friend of the channel, friend of the podcast. She is a Mass Effect content creator and a variety game content creator as well. So you can find lots of interesting games on her channel. Big welcome to N7 Kate. Hello, guys. Hello, everybody. Who's excited to talk about indoctrination theory? This girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next on our list is a, a fantastic Mass Effect creator. Uh, not only does she cover RPGs and also uh, Mass Effect in detail, but she's also looking after the new Exodus game as well. Oh, it's yeah. Content creator, a artist, a, a pin designer, you name it, everything is under her belt. It is Carla Elizabeth. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All good. Okay, good. And finally, but not uh, at least the, the last, a new Mass Effect content creator. Absolutely fantastic theory videos. It is uh, Paragon 7. Hello, hello, guys. Uh, yeah, you guys can call me Paragon 7 or Paragon or Atharia. Uh, and I'm really glad that you liked the uh, like the Geth video, Poppy. That was a really, really fun one to make. Um, and thank you so much for for the invite here. Um, it's so great. Just I think I'm, I'm probably the newer Mass Effect creator on the scene. So thank you so much for for inviting me. Welcome. Uh, okay, so this is your spoiler warning. We are going to be talking about Mass Effect 3's ending, mostly in detail. Uh, so if you don't want to hear it or haven't played it, uh, make sure you do. Go and play uh, the Legendary got... Edition now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and for those that don't know about the indoctrination theory, a, a brief summary is that the, uh, the Reapers throughout the course of the trilogy have been trying to indoctrinate uh, Shepard. And then the, the last ending part of the game where you uh, run towards a beam is the final push of them trying to indoctrinate you to choose either synthesis or control. Um, so I've talked enough already. I shall hand over to our guests. And just with a simple question, um, does anybody here actually don't like the indoctrination theory? Can I, can I say something? Sure. Okay. I've been thinking about the indoctrination theory for the last few days. And I think I I don't have any ill towards the indoctrination theory, but I think the existence of it is sad. The fact that fans had to come up with such a heavily detailed and arguably more concise and thought out theory than what maybe we actually got to cope with the ending and their experience with it is so depressing. Like, that's so sad. That is such, like, so I never, like, get mad at people for mentioning the indoctrination theory or being, like, you know, wanting to choose that as their, like, canon. Like, if you want to, if you want that to be what your shepherd experience is, fine. Um, I just think the actual existence of it needing to, like, be how people coped with the ending. And I didn't play... Um, like I played with the legendary edition. That was my first experience. So I have no connection to the originally released, you know, the before the extended cut. But it's just it's so so I don't ever like hate it or anything. I just feel bad that people had to hope that way because it's really like what it is. Essentially, it's just people trying to make sense of an ending that doesn't really make a lot of sense. I, I do think it's um. It's also a little bit sadder, to be honest, that it actually, I think it, it in some ways it makes more sense than what the actual truth is as well. I think that's kind of the sadder truth of it as well. It's, 
you know, people genuinely believed it was a fact before, you know, Bioware said what they said. I think it was, there was a post or something, wasn't there, where they debunked it? Yeah, I mean, they confirmed it's not canon. Um, I think they did that just before the Legendary Edition came out. I think it was a Chris Hepler. Uh, who was one of the writers on Mass Effect 2 and Mass Effect 3. And he basically said, like, it's a fan theory. We were not that smart. Apparently, at one point, they were considering indoctrination as a as a potential, like, something that was going to happen as part of Mass Effect 3. But they couldn't, they couldn't make it work in terms of the gameplay, so they gave up on that idea. I played Mass Effect 3 right when it came out. So when the indoctrin, like, when I first played the ending, I'm not going to lie, I went through like, like you know, you need like the, the the many stages of grief, <laughs> like you know, <laughs> denial, anger, frustration, trying to make sense of it all. Like I went through all of that. So when the indoctrination theory came out, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of latched onto it, you know, to to sort of justify it because the ending was, it was horrific in its original state before they brought out the extended edition, because effectively you went Mass Effect three the mass relays get destroyed and if we know anything from arrival that's not a good thing you know from what happened with the batarians so i thought i had basically like annihilated everybody <laughs> like in the galaxy in the milky way and stranded all of these races like at earth so everything that you had fought for up to that point seemed kind of kind of pointless so yeah, like I, 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 the indoctrination theory is the is actually the thing that actually inspired me to make a YouTube channel. Like that's how long I've been going, <laughs> like like ten to twelve years. That's insane. But it was watching other content creators, watching fan theories, watching the community try to make sense of all of the plot holes and all of the things that didn't make sense in the ending. But over the years, as I have kind of like reflected on on the indoctrination theory there are a lot of plot holes with it there are a lot of problems with it things that you know it doesn't explain um and and i th i just don't think it it's not very bioware because because the whole belief of the indoctrination theory is there is technically really only what one right answer which is to destroy the you know the reapers and obviously choose destroy because then you fight you know, you, you break out of indoctrination, right? And if you can, if you choose control and synthesis, you're giving in to the Reapers. So it's just not very Bioware. Like Bioware would never have done that. And and then it wouldn't have ended Shepard's story properly because obviously if you ended it by breaking out of indoctrination, what, then the Reapers are still there? Shepard doesn't really get a proper ending because you don't see the continuation, you know what I'm saying? So like... When you reflect on it more further, there are problems with it. But I'm not going to lie. When it first came out, like I was like everyone else in the Mass Effect community, I've just don't, going, please, please, somebody make sense of all this. Um, and yeah, because obviously it was, it's my favorite game series, as you guys know. Um, I was heavily invested, <laughs> let's just say that, um, in the ending. And I was heavily just disappointed. I think the extended cut did fix a lot of things, those, those things. Um, so I think maybe if you had played like the version of the game that came with the extended cut, you might not have felt as, you know, viscerally, I suppose, as I did when it first came out. Yeah, uh, to jump off of that point, um, when I first played Mass Effect, it was the Legendary Edition. So I played it with the extended cuts. Um, and I will say, even with my experience, I still felt incredibly confused and disappointed. Like, I'm, I'm not sure how much the extended cuts helped with making the story of it make sense. Um, because I think, like, I've tried to reflect on this and, and understand what about the end sequence kind of really bothered me. Um, and like you had said, Kate, like, it, it's very much from a, it's confusing. Like, it doesn't feel like Bioware. It didn't feel like they were tying up all the plot threads and stuff like that. It felt like, okay, all of a sudden, we are just going to, you know, have a random star child here that's going to explain something to us as opposed to having like a final boss scene like the human reaper or with Saren. Um, so it just it felt super confusing. So I, I personally think that something that's incredibly smart about the indoctrination theory is it pulls on something like, you know, Shepard becoming indoctrinated after interacting with Object Row and like, you know, Shepard's dream sequences having like 
all these oily shadows and like, you know, trying to make sense of, okay, Shepard got shot in the shoulder right before like Marauder Shields rocked up. But now all of a sudden Shepard's holding like their side when they're talking with Anderson and stuff. It's just a smart theory that kind of pulls everything together and ties it back to a plot thread like indoctrination that was present from the first Mass Effect, right? Like you see Saren becoming indoctrinated. In Arrival, you see the entire team that was, you know, working on Project Rogue becoming indoctrinated and then a Mass Effect 3 with the elusive man. So from just a story standpoint throughout the entire trilogy, the indoctrination theory makes more sense, unfortunately, than this random star child that was presented to us and how that child said that we should kind of deal with the reviews. So yeah, I I personally am a fan of the theory, um, but obviously with the writing team kind of debunking it and stuff like that, like it, it kind of obviously uh, ruins the credibility to some extent, but it's a very fan, uh, a fun fan theory. I think, um, I think they, I kind of get the impression that the they might have been going down that road at some point, but it, it got scrapped because there is so many little details that are in there. I mean, it could be argued that, you know, people have been clutching at straws and just looking for anything to fit the theory. But with the amount of little details, I mean, I watched it again today and you think, oh, yeah, that could work. And actually, that could work. And that kind of makes sense. So there, there is a lot of stuff in there that, that might have been planned, but never actually followed through with. Um, yeah, to go off of that, one thing that I really, really enjoyed about the theory was the um, the oil shadows. I thought, and yeah. It streams. Your your mic um, is kind of because it just cutting it out. Seems so random. Oh, is it okay? I'm hearing you cutting out. It might be my internet. Is it okay now? Yeah, you sound okay now. Yeah, I'm not sure what okay. uh, what was going on. Yeah, you sound better now. Okay, okay, sorry. Let me know if that happens again. Feel free to interrupt. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, not sure uh, if you caught that first part, but the one thing that I really enjoyed about the theory, and uh, like Poppy said, like it, um, there is hints of potential like this could have been planned by the team because of something like the oily shadows in Shepard's dream sequences. Um, because when Shepard spoke with the Rachni Queen on Novaria through the Asari, um, the Rachni Queen was like, you know, indo indoctrination felt like oily shadows invading mm -hmm. her. So mm -hmm. it's just, it makes so much sense, you know? Um, yeah. And that's something again that I absolutely love about it. And they totally could have done it, but it does. It does feel kind of weird that the writing team decided to be like, "No, we, we didn't want to go there because it it totally could work." I think the dream sequences as well, because because they're such a dream state. They are, and Bioware loves this, like things being open to interpretation, right? They love this. So you could see the oily shadows, right, as as sort of yes, the, those hints of indoctrination, and then the voices that you hear, because you do, as Shepard is, you know, running and chasing the child, you do hear voices and things like that. But it could also be interpreted in a, in another way which is, you know, Shepard, obviously, I always kind of look to that as Shepard's kind of guilty conscience, right? And and then I think there was even this, like, um, uh, like concept art book that came out, and they sort of said that the child was, like, this representation of everybody that Shepard had failed to save. And as, as Shepard has more and more dream sequences further on in the game, the oily shadows increase now you could interpret that if you believe in the indoctrination theory as being the you know the sh this the reaper indoctrination attempt is getting stronger and the trying to indoctrinate shepherd but you could also interpret it as these oily shadows represent the fact that more and more people are dying the fact that that, that they're losing more people during the war especially after thesia and then shepherd the voices that you hear are voices like morden Right. And I think you hear Caden at one point if Caden died in Mass Effect 1. I think you hear Legion at one point as well. So it's so interesting because it could be either. <laughs> so it could, be, you know, it depends on your interpretation. I always saw it as Shepard's guilty conscience, but I could certainly see where people would, would also see that as like 
oily voices and sour notes, like like exactly like the Ratnai Queen talks about. You know? I would say, um, I just, it's really interesting what you said about interpretations, Kate, because mm -hmm. I was just wondering, and this is just a general question for all of you, like, do you feel like there's maybe then one sort of direct theory, like there's there's just one theory, or is there different ways that you can kind of think about it or interpret it like because I know some people will say like oh if you choose synthesis or if you choose control then that kind of stuff is what the reaper what the reapers want but do you think there's a different way to interpret that I think there is I mean I mean the star child for me always had an agenda I never trust that kid you know what I mean like even <laughs> when I was in the final sequence and I mean, even, even as you meet him he's like you know he says something like we something something so he refers himself to himself almost as a reaper even though he's supposed to be the catalyst right so he's a representation of the reapers it's very clearly he doesn't want you to choose destroy right very clear in in all the consequences that he mentions very clear he wants you to choose control or synthesis even the three choices when you look at it are interesting because destroy is colored red which is supposed to signify the renegade option right um mm. control is blue which as we interpret as the paragon choice the right quintessential choice even though many people played as renegade but from the perspective of the reapers sure they don't want destroy and it's not just destroying the reapers it's also destroying all synthetic life so they could very much see that as a renegade choice right you know that they wouldn't want so it's very manipulative um, so in some ways, yes, you could see it as a manipulation of Shepard, which I think it was ultimately, um, which is probably why I always generally canonically go for destroy. <laughs> um, and it's also interesting that, you know, you see an image of like, I think and uh, Anderson, you know, shooting, choosing destroy. And we trust Anderson, right? Like, like wholeheartedly like he's our mentor um, and then you see the elusive man choose control and the elusive man is also indoctrinated at this point so that's what the reapers would want you know what I mean so it's interesting I think because it's so left because there are so many wires to, like strings to pull on and because it is not it's not tidy <laughs> it's not tidy storytelling and because the storytelling is not and we know that you know Bioware like things open to interpretation but this is the ending but you have to pull things together you have to pull all your threads together and it needs to have a cohesive ending I personally because because Bioware I think I think there was going to be another ending which was the dark theory and that got leaked or something so they had to change the ending um so I actually think even the ending, the one that they wrote, maybe wasn't too clear, like even when they wrote it. So because because even then they've left it open to interpretation, that's what's allowed the indoctrination theory to grow and, and to, to, to become as big as it did become because it was so left open to interpretation. I think if I were had done a, bit, a better job writing the ending with a clear, cohesive ending, to Shepard's story, they didn't feel so unfinished and, and so confusing, we wouldn't even be discussing this right now because there wouldn't be a need for it. So, yeah. Can I, can I touch on that? Mm -hmm. I think when we think about the endings and why they turned out the way that they did, it's kind of important to remember that it wasn't an entire team of writers coming to write the ending. It was Mac Walters and Casey Hudson essentially isolating themselves from the rest of the team and not consulting them. And previous writers have spoken about how upset they were and they didn't think this was a good decision. And it's very reflective in the final product that like no one else consulted or gave feedback or whatever. And number one, that in itself feels anti-Bioware. Like that doesn't feel correct with the usual way that they operate but unfortunately we are still feeling the effects of those decisions what it's been gosh it's I can't do math it's been like 12 years since Mass Effect 3 and people still cannot coherently explain exactly what happened or what all of it means like 
And I say that as someone, you know, obviously I've analyzed everything. I know you guys all have too. Like we all know the intricacies intricacies of the ending and we all still don't 100% understand it or are able to make sense of it. And that is going to be, in my opinion, something that they will have to address in Mass Effect 5. They're going to have to be like, here is more exposition on what actually happened what actually happened with Shepard's choice and I know that a lot of people don't want that to be explored but like I feel like they have to I feel like they have to be like you guys have been asking questions for years which you know doubled with the legendary edition coming out and you know making all these theory videos about what could happen in the next game is so hard because we still don't know what happened in the last one (laughs) It so, could yeah. be their way out, to be fair, um, because Andromeda was supposed to be their get-out clause so that all three choices mattered and they didn't have to canonize an ending because they're going to be making a new one that that carries on the the Milky Way story, or at least in some part it does. It could If they could go back and use the indoctrination theory as a, as a means to explain how every choice still matters because it never actually really mattered if that makes sense yeah no i've i've in a lot of my theory videos talking kind of about where the timeline of the next game could take us i think that the easiest route that they could go is pushing the milky way timeline to the andromeda 2819 and basically being like enough time has passed Synth, you know, synthetics and and organics have basically all evolved to the same level, depending on, you know, or in like completely not dependent on what choice that you made, like say synthetic or after you choose the synthesis ending, everybody's green synthesis icon things, whatever, have essentially gone away with like evolution or that was just a process that, that they needed to get comfortable in that body. I don't know. I just feel like there's I totally agree. I think that they could very easily be like, the endings don't really matter because they all end up with the same outcome in the end. Like the Corians and Geth both live on, both figure out peace. The Krogan live um, and, you know, rebuild Tuchanka. I mean, there's just so many things that it makes sense. So yeah, I don't think that they have to address the endings in a way that is expand expanded upon but i think with last year's n7 day where they specifically say like what happened to all of our squad mates what happened in all the endings i think that they know that people are really wanting more from those endings just to kind of cope to kind of understand better and i think be able to be able to move forward yeah, I think people need closure. I think I think that's what people didn't have properly is closure to be able to move on to accept something else. I think that's why so many people, even though I I did hadn't I didn't have a problem with Andromeda, but I think they just moved on and ignored what happened right in the endings and everything. So I think they do need that closure. But I don't think they're going. I don't think the indoctrination theory is going to be addressed. I don't. It's it's definitely not canonical. Um, why would they let like like Chris Hepler obviously did an interview I think it was like February 2021 which is just before the legendary edition came out now they had had 12 years to address the indoctrination theory publicly and they only did it after Mass Effect 4 had been announced and we'd seen trailer footage and the legendary edition came out and I think that's purposeful I think that's them saying it's it's a great idea we love it but it's a fan theory and it's not canonical and we never planned it and it isn't part of the law. So I think they do have to address the endings and, and whether or not they choose a canonical ending with destroy or anything, which they're doomed. If they do, they're doomed if they don't, honestly, because people want their choices to matter, obviously uh, into the next mass effect. But I, I, I think Bioware personally, even though I quite enjoy the indoctrination theory and discussing it and debating it. I do think they're going to look to put it behind them. Um, And I don't think it is, it is classed as canonical, not, not by Bioware anyway, they consider it a fan theory. Something I wanted to touch on that Kala had mentioned was 
what Mike Gamble wrote in that blog post was all of those questions that fans have, you know, like I think he wrote like, what does a baby volus sound like? And I, I believe he also wrote the ending. So mm -hmm. he's definitely aware of it. And on Twitter, even I think uh, on one of your tweets, Kala, when you were like, list your craziest theories, Gamble himself replied with like something along the lines of if Marauder Shields lived, then, you know, then yeah. this would happen. Right. Yeah. yeah. So like, I think that it's, it's a pretty telling sign that the franchise director of Mass Effect, like Mike Gamble, he seems to have a very solid finger on the pulse of where the fan base is, um, just in terms of everything, you know, our curiosity, uh, what we're concerned about, what we want to see in the next game and, and stuff like that. So just from like the endings perspective, I do think that it is going to be addressed. Um, and something else I wanted to touch on was it's huge that they hired Mary DeMarl. Um, because mm. it would be it, like what happened in the endings, just in the endings of Mass Effect 3, just having her there as the senior narrative director will prevent all of those indiscrepancies and contradictions from being in place. Because as the senior narrative director, she's basically there to direct the writers to make sure that every little detail in like different character arcs, mm. um, the overall plot, the world building, like all of those things align with one another and make sense. Um, so yeah, when, when Bioware was like, we're hiring Mary DeMarle, it was such a huge relief because we won't have to like, as a fan base, come up with theories like the indoctrination theory, uh, hopefully for whatever the end game sequence in the next Mass Effect is because Mary's there, you know? So yeah, I, I, I completely trust Mary DeMarle. I have complete faith that she'll prevent <laughs> something yeah. like this from happening again. And she was, I mean, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy was fantastic. Exactly. Like the writing in that was so, so good. And the characterizations, and I really enjoyed that game. So I'm very excited for that. You know, they may, st it's not that they've put put down the indo indoctrination because it's fascinating, obviously with the Reapers. What about the, the repercussions of indoctrination? You know, so and then not just Shepard, but so, there's so many people that, that are on different planets that are indoctrinated, right? What happens after the Reapers are gone? What happens to those people that have been indoctrinated? How do you root those people out? How does society rebuild from that? How do you learn to build trust again? Like all those things are fascinating, right? Because we forget that there's a lot. That's that's how, you know, Thessia and, and different civilizations fell apart, you know, during Mass Effect 3. Uh, Rana Thanop Thanopsis, she was, she was one of them. That was um, in Mass Effect 3, I think on Thessia. She ended up being because we meet her in Mass Effect One, then in Mass Effect Two, and she's indoctrinated by the third one, and I think she ends up killing a bunch of um, important political people. I think on Thessia, um, so like it might be a case of maybe Shepard is indoctrinated, but I still think that it would be fascinating to explore that, right? Rebuilding and things like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what what did you think of indoctrination theory, Tim? Like, because you you played Mass Effect Three with same time as me when it first came out. So yeah, what, that's right. what was your reaction to it? Like when you first um, saw it? To be honest with you, I quite liked it because it, it yeah. did, it fitted a lot of, like I say, there was a lot of stuff in there that, that made sense to me. And I, I, I quite like thinking that like the elusive man and um, Anderson, it never, it never, I could never get my right head around how, he went in after you, but have got ahead of you. And then when he's talking about walking through the the area that looks like the Shadow Broker's ship. Yeah. And he says that things are moving and then you get there and like, well, nothing's really moving. And then it's like, how how are you getting ahead of me when, when you came in behind me? And to have him in the same room as the elusive man, who obviously is completely corrupted by this point, it, it kind of the way they explained it was their their two sides of Shepard's psyche, like the 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 good side and the the, the bad side, and breaking it down that that uh, he you know Shepard in his mind has he gets he shoots I think he shoots Anderson in his his abdomen, mm -hmm. and then when he's sitting next to Anderson, he's then bleeding from that same gunshot wound, so as if he he's kind of shot himself that sort of thing. It, it it's like everything that that it, it to me it kind of made sense and i i quite like the idea that the crucible was only designed to do one thing 
whether you picked whatever you picked it, it to be, that's what it was actually designed to be. So if you picked synthesis, it it would always be a synthesis um, MacGuffin. And even though you know you get knocked out and Shepard, and because in the destroy ending, Shepard is he, he takes a or she takes a, a breath um, at the end, and what clearly looks to be London rubble. Mm. So again, how explaining how you they would have got from space all the way down to London and still be alive? How they even survived that explosion? Yeah, and how you know explain it's sort of bit, that exactly? Mm. Then, um, then you know, taking that that final breath, it to me it, everything it does fit quite nicely into it, and I think if they do decide to to double back, I know they've they've, they've debunked it. But if they do decide to double back on it, it is a great way to bring Anderson and the elusive man back into the game. Because if they were never actually there in the first place, then they never actually die. My name is Scott Ryder, Tom Taylorson, calling in for the Andromeda Galaxy. And you are listening to the Lazarus Project podcast. I, I, I do kind of find it interesting. Like a lot of people, and to be honest, on all of these factors as well, it makes perfect sense with the indoctrination theory. Um, but I just, I just want, actually, yeah, my mic is on. Um, <laughs> um, I was just wondering, like, so to, to you guys then, because I was just sort of thinking about my interpretation and I was thinking about where I feel like, to me, the dream sequence starts and ends. In in you in your guys' minds, like, like, did Anderson die then? Because I know, like, to, from what you're saying, Tim, Anderson was never on, you know, the Citadel, so... Um, are you in in your mind in the indoctrination theory? Did Anderson not die, or did he die like on the run up to the beam? Or it, it could have been, yeah. I mean, the way I I play, because I always pick the story as well. Um, I, I, from the very start of Mass Effect One, Shepard was out to destroy the Reapers, and so I kind of stick with that all the way through. So yeah, I mean, so, yeah, you can you can include the indoctrination theory if you really wanted to. Or you can go with how the developers. It's quite nice how they've given you a choice and ending, uh, so you can pick you what you can pick your own ending. Um, and then obviously, if you wanted to include this, it's not going to do any harm to you because, well, until Mass Effect Five comes out, we find out a definitive answer to what happened to Shepard. If we find out that, then um, yeah, there's, there's there's no harm in including it. So if you want to think that Anderson died on the run up there, then yeah, you can do. If, I like to th think that because that beam of, of light, not beam of light, the beam hitting from Harbinger, I can't see how anybody could possibly survive that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you get knocked back and then all of a sudden you, your arm has changed um, and you've got infinite ammo in your gun. And, you know, there's all these little things that if they've gone out of the way to... Um, to make sure that cutscenes and dream sequences and stuff like that, as you're wearing the armor that you've picked and you've designed of the color scheme, then all of a sudden for that last sequence, you're, you're in different armor to what you might have picked. So, for example, if you decided to wear that the Cerberus armor skin, then all of a sudden you're wearing the N7 armor. It, stuff like that. It, it's like, I know that they were pushed for time and I know they had to change the ending um because it got, it got leaked but at the same time little details like that they haven't that they, they would always make sure that that in, in like q a and stuff that would have been picked up so. it does make you question it doesn't it because bioware is a developer that like their details and everything that is placed in cutscenes or anything there's a purpose to it there always has been so when you see such glaring inconsistencies it just makes you go, huh, was that purposeful or not? You know, and I like that, you know, but but I think, yeah, 100%, like with the armor and everything like you're saying and the infinite ammo and, and stuff like that. And then, like, I think in the indoctrination video, they mentioned the piles of bodies, which have, like, the armor, I think it's the Phoenix armor of um, Ashley in Mass Effect 1, right? And then Caden's armor in Mass Effect 1. How do you, how do you explain that? <laughs> like... 
this is weird that's weird like did they just have somebody in textures like right we've got we've got five minutes guys right okay let's just throw in some textures and some colors no one will look at it they'll just walk right past it come on guys <laughs> this is bioware fans but it's just things like that you can't you can't answer a definitive reason for why so it just makes you question it what did you guys think when you saw the pile of dead bodies Were you like what is that what's going on or did you just think it was by way of being lazy in you know i thought i think when i look at the indoctrination theory specifically the details um behind why people believe in it i think like the armor and the infinite ammo i think those are just gameplay choices like the reality is they were never going to be able to have one cohesive armor for the end if they wanted it to be that badly destroyed. There's no real development issue or development like route that they could have gone to have, you know, uh, animated and, um, you know, created a, a new mold for every, a new model for every armor set that was decayed like that. So I think having one that is like very charred and you know it being the default i think that that makes sense same with the uh final scene imagine if you ran out of out of ammo during that final scene what like what realistically what, how stupid would that look like and how much would that take you out of the moment um but i do have three things with the indoctrination theory that i think are bad writing decisions which lean so much into the indoctrination theory making sense and one that is the armor ashley's armor we don't we haven't seen that since mass effect 2 so for and like no one in mass effect 3 none of the ground team no one is wearing it so them using that very weird very weird choice there and second everything with anderson very weird you could probably write it off as just them like thinking that people wouldn't notice that he got there way before us and we didn't see him. And there's like timeline inconsistencies there. But I think my biggest issue with it is how is the elusive man able to do what he does? And how is Shepard able to be controlled to, you know, like that bothers me the most out of like the many questions around the ending how was Shepard able to be controlled by the elusive man like how like because he's not using biotics because stasis is more of like a freeze it's not you know a movement ability and yet the elusive man is able to control people's actions that has always really really confused me and doesn't really make sense it kind of comes out of left field I have some theories on that. Okay, let's hear it. Because I, I, that is the, th like, out of the indoctrination theories, I'm like, that makes me really lean into the indoctrination theory. Because of the it's so Yeah, it's, yeah, there's like, okay, the, and the reaper sounds and, uh -huh. or the, the growling type of sound. So that's why I've always been like, this moment itself mm -hmm. has to like, be very indicative of something. I think a, a lot of, you know, the elusive man that we see at the end of Mass Effect 3, everything, the whole setup, it's very reminiscent of Saren, right, in Mass Effect 1, when you meet Saren at the end. I personally think that if we have a look at the elusive man, I, I personally think that it's it's Reaper tech. That's what happened with, with Saren, that, that he got, you know, synthesized, like, in terms of had Reaper tech into him, and that's why he turned into this, like, deformed kind of you know that could crawl on like ceilings and stuff like that and I think the elusive man I think it's some form of reaper tech so maybe they're you maybe the the reapers may even be using him as like like um like a what do you call it when they use it as like a an, a, a bounce off point what do you call that <laughs> I've been working all day I can't think of words wait like an antenna like a like an amplifier like a, like a vessel like a vessel like an amplifier so I feel like there's some kind of reaper tech and that the reapers are using the elusive man potentially as an amplifier to get closer to to Shepard to potentially try to control and manipulate Anderson and Shepard, whether that involves some attempt of indoctrination, which would explain, obviously, the growls and that kind of thing. But it's clearly re Reaper tech. And we see that as well with their eyes, because Saren's eyes and the elusive man's eyes have that kind of blue 
like tint to them. And those eyes have nothing to do with indoctrination. That is a sign of Reaper tech. And we see the same in Shepard when he chooses control, when he or synthesis. He's combining with, he's already got Reaper tech. He or she has already got Reaper tech in them anyway from the Lazarus project. But also choosing those options, it amplifies the volume of Reaper tech in his system. And we see his eyes go too. So I think it's it's Reaper tech, Reaper technology. And they're maybe using the elusive man as a as a, so when when that reaper tech when the elusive man comes close to shepherd and you hear it come in and you see the vines come in as like anderson turns doesn't he and he starts to sort of move all very stiff and as if he's being controlled and then we see the elusive man walk behind shepherd and then obviously we see these wisps i think that is the reaper tech being used to try and control shepherd and then as as the elusive man as he starts fighting that control and whether or not you maybe manage to convince him that he is indoctrinated and he admits to that those wisps start pulling away because that reaper technology because he's fighting against it so I, that's how i've always interpreted it that it is reaper technology but they might potentially be using him as an amplifier to stop Shepard to stop Anderson being able to sort of connect the Citadel and the Crucible and destroy the Reapers. Yeah, one thing that I wanted to touch on was I think it kind of goes back to they didn't know exactly what the elusive man was going to be mm -hmm. in the endgame. Um, because I, I can't remember if it was in the final hours of Mass Effect 3 that Jeff Cayley did or if it was in the Bioware 25 book, but there was a picture somewhere where the elusive man was supposed to be kind of like a really warped end game boss. Yeah. Um, yeah. That. Like, yeah. So to me, it kind of goes back to like, I'm not sure because it was just Mac Walters and Casey Hudson at the end. I'm not sure even in the lead up to end game, they entirely knew what they wanted that to look like mm -hmm. because uh, something that I wanted to touch on uh, to Craig's question on like, what do you think about did Anderson die and stuff? I don't even know if, those two, uh, uh, Walters and Hudson, if they knew whether they wanted Shepard to die, because um, there were some um, lines recorded by, uh, oh man, I'm blanking on Anderson's voice actor name, um, Keith as well David. as Keith David. Yes, Keith David, He's as well as him. Jennifer Hale. <laughs> yeah, oh man, he absolutely killed it. Um, but Keith David and Jennifer Hale, where there was a discussion on motherhood, where Anderson was mm -hmm. asking like, do, have you ever considered being a mother? Mm -hmm. That's super weird and a really strange thing to get the voice actors to record if Shepard was going to die. So I honestly think that even at that stage where they got the voice actors to like, you know, record their lines and stuff, which is very late in the release, um, they weren't sure how that was going to look. Um, they weren't sure if Anderson was going to die. They weren't sure if Shepard was going to die. Um, they weren't sure if the elusive man was going to be an endgame boss versus just kind of that strange conversation that they had on indoctrination and stuff. So yeah, to to just all of it, I, I think it goes back to, I, I, I think that because they didn't know what they were driving towards in, in, in the final scene and how Shepard's story was going to end, um, it probably resulted in, in, you know, having three different endings where they were kind of like, okay, let's let the players decide. <laughs> which obviously opens just a whole can of worms and results mm -hmm. in things like the indoctrination theory where we're like, we would have preferred to have at least something that kind of connects all of them, you know? Because mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's necessarily bad to have multiple endings, but if there's just one singular thing, you know, like either Shepard living in all the endings or Shepard dying, it's something that all of the fan base can kind of be like, okay, this is the one thing that was the point of the entire trilogy, you know? Um, because, yeah, it, it's different across all of them. Hmm. Um, I do find, to be honest, what you said um, just now, uh, Paragon, sorry, what you just said now about, um, sorry, I was thinking about asking the chat something and now my mind's a bit scrambled. Um, but what you said about the cut content of asking about having kids, if Shepard wanted to have kids, what you just said there about, like, that could have only been taken out if like Shepard was intended to live that was really interesting um but that that whole bit that you um while, while we're kind of on that subject though that conversation between Anderson and Shepard do you guys think that conversation actually happened or do you um, think it's part of the Reaper manipulation or yeah it's it's such an interesting um 
It's such an interesting, I guess, question. I personally don't believe in the indoctrination theory, um, obviously, because it's been debunked by the writers. So when I'm viewing that specific scene, um, even though it, it it obviously doesn't make any sense why Anderson's saying the walls are moving and, and all of that stuff, and how did he get ahead of us? Um, I just kind of chalk that down to, you know, the, the writing not being on point and stuff like that. Um, so when I view that final conversation, I... I mean, the first time I ever viewed it, I was extremely emotional. It felt like it was the one thing that they got extremely correct, mm -hmm. um, where it was just when Anderson tells Shepard that, you know, like I played Femme Shep, so the line is, you know, you've done good, child. Um, it was just, it was so powerful. Um, so, and I would have preferred the conversation to, to, you know, my my female shepherd to kind of go that route of talking about motherhood and talking about kids just because that's kind of what I wanted my shepherd to, you know, end off on and have the happy ending. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I kind of view that conversation as as having happened and 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 being true because it just it it felt like the one thing that Anderson is the he's he's either the first or the second voice you hear at the start of Mass Effect, right? With the conversation with Udina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so it just, it felt so right to have him there right at the end and just kind of yeah. just, just, just hammering home. Like, yeah, you did it, you know? Um, which is why everything that happens afterward, I kind of just ignore. Um, because that to me felt like a very solid place to end the series. Mm. I liked as well in that scene that, that Shepard wasn't alone, <laughs> you know, because I, I really didn't want my Shepard either to survive or to die alone you know what I mean and and as you progress through obviously Mass Effect 3 like Shepard Bless like does become traumatized through the war and seems to not isolate themselves but you know they feel like they're alone they're taking on the weight of the galaxy you know you know by themselves and there's so much expectation and pressure on them I really liked that scene with Anderson um, and I would I would like to think it existed that it was a real thing. And Anderson, in my head canon, was a father figure uh, to my shepherd. You know, um, she looked up to him. He was like the dad that she didn't have. You know what I mean? And so I, I got really emotional <laughs> at that scene. And even listening to that hidden sound by, I was like, oh, you know, kind of. I really did. So I, I like to think that Shepherd wasn't alone in that. Even though Shepherd's an absolute badass and would have got the job done. You know whatever i've always believed that shepherd is so successful because he or she is not alone has never been alone you know has always had people standing with her whether that's other races friends her crew you know that so i really didn't want shepherd to be alone in that final moment you know um so i think even when you choose destroying you get flashes don't you of your crew and stuff like that um no, it's making me emotional just talking about it. Um, but yes, I did like that that scene with Anderson, and I'd like to think it happened. I, th Even I think it's sorry, sorry. Um, I, I I think it's the one thing that kind of made me not want the indoctrination to have started at that point because I don't like to think that that moment was fake or anything. Mm -hmm. Like that moment between them was real. I like to believe that the real manipulation starts when he ascends to heaven or whatever you want to call that <laughs> sorry go on tim i was just going to say even though the the indoctrination theory has been debunked i still don't think it's implausible that the reapers would try to indoctrinate the shepherd mm -hmm. and obviously they've done it to seren and the elusive man and countless of other people so there, i mean there, there could be elements of them actually trying even though it it's that it wasn't successful. Mm -hmm. Well, they clearly class Shepard as the biggest threat to them, you know, um, most definitely. You know, why would Harbinger even bother like to taunt Shepard unless, you know, they classed Shepard as a, as a real threat? And there's certainly been plenty of opportunities <laughs> for it to happen. Uh, Shepard through Mass Effect 1, Mass Effect 2, Mass Effect 3 uh, has had quite a lot of contact with reaper technology reaper artifacts um you know um so there's plenty of opportunity there i think the hardest thing to to prove with indoctrination theory is when did it happen 
how you know if if Shepard was indoctrinated how how has that progressed when did that begin at what point did that indoctrination start to take hold um whether or not you see the dream sequences as an indication of that as they could progressively get worse or not depends on your interpretation but it's really hard to to pinpoint that and I think that's where there's a lot of discussion and debate you know um I think something oh sorry Kate no go on go on what are you saying yeah something that I wanted to just touch on was I think the Mass Effect team themselves didn't realize how like in depth the fan base needed explanations right because mm. we were given absolutely no explanation as to why Shepard wasn't indoctrinated why any of our squad mates weren't indoctrinated mm -hmm. um because arguably like ours the Normandy squad interacted with the Reapers the most so the fact there was you know no explanation given um and something I wanted to kind of discuss there and I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on um is I think that there was a shift in the team understanding that the fan base really needs that type of in-depth explanation on things um with Andromeda because as soon as I loaded into Andromeda, it, it felt like there was such a clear, like scientific, trying to make every small thing make sense shift in storytelling. Like I think there were moments where um, you would be talking with like an Angaran, and sometimes they would say a very um, Angaran specific word, mm -hmm. and writer themselves would be like, "Oh, hang on, I think my translator blipped. I didn't understand that." Whereas something with the Quarians, like whenever they said "Kila Salai," that was never explained as to why we weren't hearing the translation for that. Um, so yeah, like when I was playing it, it really felt like the Mass Effect team took everything from the trilogy where they were like, the fans really need us to world build more and kind of flesh things out. Why like have explanations for things that, that didn't necessarily have one. Um, so yeah, I kind of just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that. Like, what did you guys think about that kind of shift? And do you think it was from, uh, I guess the fallout of things like the indoctrination theory. I, I think I agree. I was just, um, I've restarted an Andromeda playthrough and I'm getting really just burnt out on the over explaining where it feels like the world doesn't allow you to experience things. It has to tell you and you can definitely feel how much they put into Ryder having to explain to the player what is happening and like what needs to be done. There's, I feel like it, it removes a bit of the, I don't want to say mystery, I guess, but it, I, I think it ruins a bit of the immersion in that you feel like you're really being told how to play, what exactly to do what everybody thinks like there's no like you're never really guessing as to what anyone is feeling or thinking or whatever and just like you were saying the you know the keyless keyless yeah keyless ally i'm thinking of the arc <laughs> um but uh yeah those things are never like you have to like find out for yourself and that was so great about the immersion in the alien cultures and their worlds that you really did feel like you were being shown a little bit, but you weren't 100% a part of it. And that was okay. Whereas I feel like, you know, with Andromeda, the Jardin tried to make you one of them as much as possible. And like, on one hand, I get it. But I also feel like it kind of watered down their culture a tiny bit to me. That's just my opinion, though. On, but I do, other, I do feel what you're talking about, though, with the explaining everything, and I, I do wonder if that has to do with the ending. I didn't even, to be honest, think about um, the fact that um, Tali. The it's really stupid of me, to be honest, to have not realized that. Yeah, she literally says "Kila Salai" and it's not translated. It's it, it's funny how that didn't click with me. Um, but there are also some unanswered questions in Andromeda as well. Like we never found out about the scourge, really, did we? So it was kind of, I mean, I know that's probably something that they planned to answer, like in later games. But yeah, I think I, that it was cool. Oh, sorry, were you gonna say something further? No, no, no. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting what what Kala said as well. Like 
it almost feels like they took the magic out of the fact that it is supposed to be a bit of an unknown. Like thinking about Mass Effect 1 and the reason that I fell in love with the series was because it just felt like there was so much out there, you know, like in in the Mass Effect universe. Um, And yeah, whenever we learned about a new kind of alien, like cultural thing, it felt like just the best thing in the world. And I didn't want to know every little thing about it because it, to me, that mystery made it more magical. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, to touch on what Craig said about the Scourge and stuff, I I think Andromeda, it it felt a little bit like scientific, like I mentioned earlier, like it it felt like, okay, we're going to tell you exactly what you're, you know, allowed to know with X, Y, Z, but then you're going to be completely lost with things like the Scourge, with things like the Jardin um, and stuff like that. So it, it did feel a little bit like that, that magic was, was gone a little bit, even though we went to an entirely different galaxy, you know, like that should have been the moment where that magic was back and that we didn't know everything. Um, so it is an interesting choice. And I, I really do think it, it it was birthed from fans just wanting an explanation for every little thing in, in the endings. But I think, I think they, they probably went about it in the wrong way. Um, obviously, like Kate said, damned if you do, damned if you don't, like there's not a perfect way. You're, you're never going to satisfy a hundred percent of your fan base. Um, so yeah, but, but I do find it, I find it interesting. The stuff on the Scourge, the stuff that are still mysterious in Andromeda does very much intrigue me. Um, just because it, it, it feels like it has that, that little bit of magic that could kind of bring back those, those Mass Effect 1 vibes specifically. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, I mean, we're coming up to an hour. Um, do you guys want to give your, your final thoughts on the uh, the indoctrination theory? Do you think it was something that it could have had legs if the developers got behind it, or was it just complete fan theory that, that uh, it should be just left as that and shouldn't be picked up any further? I... I think that the indoctrination theory removes Shepard's agency and that is my biggest problem with it. Like while I am totally all for people, if that's what they want to choose for their Shepard, that's fine. Um, But I do feel like if, because the indoctrination theory is basically that if you choose destroy, then that is really the only option to get out of the indoctrination and that's why Shepard wakes up in the rubble. But essentially that means that the ending never really happened. Mm-hmm. And you don't actually get to make a choice as to what happened. Because that inevitably would mean that Shepard was in the rubble and was incapacitated. And the Reapers would have been able to do whatever they wanted to do. So I don't think that really leans into giving the giving the player any option of a real ending especially one with a choice. And then, you know, the other side of that is if you choose the other endings, then you are for sure indoctrinated. And, but again, that really only leaves one quote unquote good choice. So I just, yeah, that's my biggest problem with it is I don't think it gives the player any agency. And while I do think that it would have been very cool if Shepard had gotten indoctrinated at some point, because all of their exposure that would have made a ton of sense story-wise. I just don't see any Bioware game being one that doesn't give you agency over your character, your story. And while I have a ton of problems with the ending, you do feel like you have some choice, even if it's not as much as we actually wanted. And I do think the indoctrination theory completely voids that and um forces forces it on you kind of out of nowhere too mm-hmm. like it would be one thing you know i know that the dreams have been associated with indoct- indoctrination but aside from the dreams there's really no other when shepherd is awake that they are being indoctrinated you know we're not having to fight with our um like fight with our player character to make decisions because we still have the autonomy over them. So it would just be super weird 
if the indoctrination theory was real. That's just my problem with it. No player agency. That's that's what I think. Mm -hmm. I kind of echo what what Carl is saying. Like, yes, okay, when it came out, it it was a coping mechanism and part of me at that time was like oh this would be amazing if Bioware planned this this whole time and and because at that point I was disappointed um you know this was a development studio that had written some of the best stories best characters I had ever known or played with or as and so I couldn't believe that they would finish the trilogy in such a way as they had done um you know, with the original ending of Mass Effect 3. So I was like, they've got to have an ace up their sleeve. They've got they've got to be planning something. And so I think part of me at that time, yes, clutched onto it. And and I think at that time, it would have been a win for Bioware for them to go, oh yeah, guys, we planned this the whole time. And then they released DLC to then finish the ending properly, right? But they didn't do that. And obviously Bioware, admitted it's it's not canon um they've debunked it themselves and I, and I agree with Carla I, I think if you just left it at the end of the indoctrination theory and Shepard had woken up it wouldn't have ended Shepard's story in a satisfactory way because so much would have been left unknown right like did Anderson die is Anderson dead or not where's the elusive man is the elusive man where it was he doing? Um, did the did the crucible make it? Like there would have been so many things that were unanswered, right? Um, so I, I don't think that would have been great. And then exactly like Kala said, like forcing players to say this is the right choice this is very non-bioware. They've always believed in player freedom, player choice, player agency. They've always believed that through every series, whether it's Dragon Age, Mass Effect, you know. Um, Knights of the Republic, whatever it is. So it's just a very unbioware thing to do. Um, so I think the more I reflect on it, the more it doesn't it doesn't feel right, you know. Um, but at the time, yeah, like it it was my way of going. Well, oh, maybe they have planned it all the time. And my faith in bioware is not misplaced, you know, kind of thing. And that's how I felt at the time. Yeah, my thoughts on it. Um, obviously. I'm a huge like fan of theories like this and a lot of my channel just covers stuff to this extent. So I'm a huge fan of how smart the theory is mm -hmm. um, and just how it, it kind of wraps up all these little discrepancies and contradictions to make something make sense. Um, and I think it's pretty telling that a lot of the fan base kind of latched onto it and it was like, yeah, this, th this makes a lot of sense. Um, but to Cal's point again, like, in an agency-based franchise like Mass Effect, to say that the entire end sequence was all a dream is a little bit, you know, confusing. Um, so while I don't personally believe in it, um, I still 100% wholeheartedly love the theory just because it's it, it's so smart. It's so creative. But it's yeah. such an indication of just how creative and amazing and passionate the Mass Effect fan bases. Exactly. You've got to respect that, you know, and and I think that's a great thing. So, and and I think like, yeah, like I think even the people that were like promoting the indoctrination theory back in the time 12 years ago, they did a petition. They raised money, I remember, for charity, like as a petition for this indoctrination theory. Say, this is, we've got this idea, you know, please do it. And, and that's just taking something that, that, that really confused people and really, upset people and hurt people you know with the ending and they try to turn it into a positive thing you know what I mean for the community I, I think that's a good thing you know and um so I like the theory I just yeah <laughs> don't think it holds up but I do like what it represents in a way can I Great. add one more thing oh, to the... I just just really quickly I think when I look at the indoctrination theory it is the result of a ending that was not fleshed out and an ending that was all too magical oh it relied too much on um the like less on the sci-fi and more on the fantasy and i think that's a major problem with it is it doesn't feel very grounded and that's why people can kind of create whatever and i hope with the next game like we see that they kind of pivoted with Andromeda. 
where everything feels maybe a bit more um, grounded in science, maybe except for, well, even maybe the creation of the Angara, which seems like that was more of a scientific undertaking to create them. But I hope moving forward for Mass Effect 5, we still get some like fantasy, but I do hope that they don't lean so far into the space magic stuff. I think that is the weakest part of like the Star Child and that stuff. I think that's my biggest biggest issue with the ending and something that I hope that they think about with Mass Effect 5 so that we don't get another indoctrination theory and people trying to cope with, you know, stuff that doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Craig, any final thoughts on uh, the indoctrination theory? Yeah, I'm going to keep this super brief because I'm somewhat desperate for a bio break. Um, uh, I, I do think that um, I do think there's a lot of thought and effort put into it, and I do really like it. And like, it's just its ideas and how much supports it and everything. But like we were talking about with that moment with Anderson, I just with so much of that, I think there are there are some bits here and there with what the, what Bioware intended that are just kind of heartfelt and nice. That I just I don't. I'm not comfortable with how the indoctrination theory would contradict certain things. So, I mean, I re I really like the indoctrination theory, but no, I kind of, I'm, I think I've come to terms with the ending in itself, especially with the extended cut. Wonderful. Um, so all that leaves me to say is a, a massive, massive thank you to all of our guests uh, for joining us. Uh, all their details are found in the description below, so make sure you go check them out and watch the content. And if you enjoy it, only if you enjoy it, make sure you subscribe. Um, I hope to have you guys all back on uh, the channel and the podcast, uh, maybe on a one-to-one -on -one so we can get to know you a bit more uh, in depth. But no, thank you ever so much for spending your time, uh, taking your time out to, to spend it with us. It's been an enjoyable chat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, yeah, thanks Tim, for, for organizing it. Thanks for inviting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys. Love to be back. Thank you so much for the invite. I love talking about theories. I'm all for this. <laughs> Same. <laughs> it's it's my bread and butter. I love it. <laughs> exactly. Got to keep going until the next Mass Effect. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have to think of a new topic for next time. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you. Uh, we we'll, we'll, I think I'm playing um, some Mass Effect multiplayer next. So uh, if anybody wants to come and watch that, then you're more than welcome to. Can I can I say it? Can I say it? Go for it. We should go. <laughs> <laughs> we should go. We should go. We should go. <laughs> we should go. I should go. <laughs> Do I really sound like that? <laughs> I am sovereign, and this station is mine. Thank you very much again to N7 Kate, Carlo Elizabeth, and N7 Paragon for joining us. If you, by any chance, are interested in supporting the podcast, please do find us on Patreon. Just search the Lazarus Project podcast. We are so excited about some of the exclusive content that's coming on there soon, including non-Mass Effect content, specifically about RPG games coming up, including Exodus. We're so excited about that content, and if you're able to support us again, it would be much appreciated, but... Absolutely no problem if you can't. But yeah, looking forward to seeing you all next time for another Mass Effect discussion. Thank you for joining us.